Okay, good morning. So yesterday I cheated a bit and I prepared some manual slides to finish the, the technical details of the proof that we had started. So we will start with that. Okay, so first I gave a reminder of uh, the TAT uh, recursion that we had found in the Schwinger or Schwinger Dyson equations of the loop model. We could see it from the two different perspectives, remember? And it's this equation that I wrote here. So we had this uh, first term equal to this polynomial and the rest of the terms that we were getting uh, in all the possible ways of removing an et. So removing an et and finding all the possible possibilities. And uh, then remember also that we defined natural objects on our Riemann surface that we had defined uh, with the polynomial equation for the K01. And they are differentials uh, that look like this. So for stable topologies, they are just uh, WGN multiplied by DX1, DXN. And for 01 and 02, you have these shifts there. And that is important because now we need to find uh, an expression using our touch recursion for the differentials, not for the WGNs. Okay, so we take, uh, we also have this remark here. This is the, actually this should be a definition. This is the kernel, what will be the kernel of the recursion. Probably you've, you've seen this formula. Um, and then you can observe that it has the property that if you change Z to one over Z, it stays the same. Because if you change it, that here, it just change the sign and uh, the same in the denominator. And then we also have this property that if you take the residue of this guy, the only important thing is that it has that property. Then this type of guy that also has uh, that property actually, because it just depends on X, not on Z. So it stays the same when you change to one over Z. So yeah, okay, maybe I should say that when I write X, I mean X of Z. And when I write X I, I mean X of Z I. Okay. Then uh, on this guy here, we can just apply our trick. Remember that if you change uh, Z to one over Z, um, the residue stays the same. So we can just do that trick and add this one half here. And then by the property of skew symmetry that we saw yesterday, this quantity here is just equal to zero because this guy, if you change, change it to one over Z, it just gives you the same changing the sign. So we will use this property in this uh, touch recursion from yesterday to arrive to the topological recursion formula for maps, which is what we wanted to do since the beginning. So, okay, yesterday we had seen that um, omega gn, we can write it as this residue. So yeah, the first equality is not super straightforward, but it's what we did yesterday in the end. Um, so we see here something that starts uh, looking like the kernel of the recursion. And then we use that recursion. So, okay, you should take the, the first formula that I wrote, transform it into differentials. So be careful with the shifts. And uh, we should plug the formula that we get for omega gn uh, in here. So, okay, this guy appears in the denominator because the first thing that we do is we remove from the last term, the quadratic one, and the topology of the disk. So we take that and we put it on the other side of the equation. That's why we get uh, this, this minus here. And uh, yeah, we also take into account the shift. So it also combines well with, uh, with the sum and that it's on the other side, the V prime times um, W01 in this case. Um, yeah, sorry, sorry, I'm, I'm saying a stupid thing. So I'm taking the term in the, in the, in the quadratic term, I'm taking the term that uh, has disks on it. So it will have um, omega zero one and omega g n, okay? So the omega zero one goes to the other side. That's uh, what it appears here. 
And we have the W01 and also the shift of the V. This is what I was saying, but uh, it combines well because it's multiplied by the topology at the end. Okay, so that's why we get uh, this denominator with this sign. And then it's just, uh, the rest is uh, quite straightforward. The only thing that you have to take into account um, is that uh, also for the quadratic term, you have the shift of the omega zero two. And that guy contributes exactly to this guy over here. So, okay, here we have uh, the contribution coming from the, um, from the term with the derivative. So the first term of the derivative is in there with positive sign. And then we have minus two uh, of the shift times this topology coming from the quadratic term and the shift for omega zero two, okay? Then uh, the rest is uh, straightforward, I think. This one is just uh, the, the second one from the derivative. And then this one is, uh, is that one, the g, g minus one and plus one. And this is the quadratic one, but with no disk because we removed the disks. So there are some things that I'm hiding here, but uh, they are not very important. So for some special topologies like one, one and zero three, you will have extra contributions of this uh, shift of zero two but they will not matter. So let's not, uh, if you want to think of the details, you can do it and see that they will not matter. So I didn't uh, add them. I just, I mean, the equality is still true because uh, the residue uh, will be zero, so it's fine. Um, so that's why I wanted to write it like that. So, okay, now that we have this, let's analyze what's uh, happening. So this guy here will have, uh, so the one, the one in the numerator will have a simple zero at the ramification point. Okay, because uh, these two guys will be the same. So it will have a simple zero. Then uh, this guy over here, we transform it into this, just using um, skew symmetry. And actually we can write it like that. And you can find then that it has a double zero at the ramification points, because these guys are the same and this guy is zero at those points. Okay, so that's important. Now we know that our kernel has a simple pole. And then this type of guys, since we are doing the residue at Z equal the ramification points, will also have a double zero. And uh, also this guy here will have a double zero. So you can see already that these terms will not survive. Okay, so maybe let me explain the colors of this formula. So I wrote everything I wrote in white is because it will be in the final shape and the rest uh, has to disappear or change a little bit. So yeah, one thing that I want to do is to change the sign. So this is very easy. I just didn't want to do it directly for things to be clear. So I have to change the sign everywhere. Um, So, okay, this one will be a minus, this one will be a plus. Just for everything to remain correct. Um, okay, and then what else uh, do we have to do? Okay, for this term over here, we have to use exactly the remark that we made. You can actually see that um, because of that remark, the, the rest is gonna be zero. So this also gives zero. And uh, yeah, to transform this guy into this guy, we just use the skew symmetry and here the same. So what we get in the end is just uh, the white terms. So this guy here, this one, and this one. And this is the formula of the topological recursion. So you can see that we started with that recursion that has quite a few terms and we reduced to just these two typical terms of the topological recursion. So this is something uh, very nice because we started from a combinatorial equation that we derived in an elementary way. And we were able to find the recursion which allows us to compute all the numbers and uh, the generating series in particular. And um, it has many less terms. So this is important, for example, if you want to find the criticalities of the problem, you will have to analyze uh, fewer terms. So this is another motivation to, to solve this problem by topological regression, for example. Okay, are there 
questions so far because now I will go to the general formalism. So I will, I'm finished with the details and I will start a bit more hand waving part of the talk. Yeah, okay. Okay, so now we go to topological recursion as a universal method. I will try to give you a bit of flavor of everything that is general, but actually you already saw a lot of features that will be there, so it should be uh, good. Okay, we start by actually defining what is a spectral curve, which is the input of the topological recursion. And I will be telling you what is a quite typical global spectral curve. But there are many little variations that you can do. So one of them uh, is just to take the local spectral curve, but okay, then uh, we would not have a global curve but it still works for topological recursion. So we just take a sigma Riemann surface of genus G. So it's just to not mix with the genus of the actual formula, which is completely different. I will just put a hat. Then we take X to be a ramified cover of the sphere. So it will be meromorphic and very important for the classical topological recursion, it will be simple. So it will only have simple ramification points. We only allow two branches of the covering to go together. Okay, and we call uh, the zeros of dx, which are the ramification points that are not poles of x, we call them alpha. Yeah, a little remark uh, is that you can also have poles of X, so points that give you infinity when, evaluated, uh, when you evaluate X at them. And they can also be ramified. And in, in some cases, these guys also play a role in the formula of topological recursion. But okay, usually they are, they are omitted, but maybe they should be included in general. I'm just trying to give you the simplest version, but hinting at some possible things to take into account when you work with actual examples. So we also have uh, omega zero one that is usually of this shape, y dx. Then we have y, which should be, again, in the simplest case, holomorphic at every pointed neighborhood of, um, of a ramification point. Um, And actually, I don't know why I'm saying pointed. It should be just holomorphic at a neighborhood of the ramification points. What, sir? I uh, yes, <laughs> and it had to be. It has to be different from zero. So this uh, over here, for example, prevents alpha from being a singular point of the of the spectral curve. So we never consider the, the ramification points to be singular points in the most, uh, in the simplest setting. So we also have, we always have uh, spectral curves that look like this. So around every ramification point, it should look like a, like a square root. And then, so this is a ramification point. And then we will always have our local involution around the ramification point. So this guy will be Z and this guy will be sigma sub alpha of Z. And I'm writing sub alpha because this is actually a local involution in general. So it will depend on the ramification point. For example, here you have another ramification point and you will have another uh, involution. In some cases, the involution is global and then the problem is a bit easier because it has more symmetry, but not in general. So, okay. 
then if the genus is um, higher than zero, which is not the, not the most typical thing that happens in many combinatorial problems or many problems that are very well understood, but uh, we should take it into account in general, we need a basis of the homology. So actually a symplectic basis, so we, we just take uh, cycles on the curve that will have some uh, special um, pairing. So for example, AI intersected with BI should be zero. And there's AI intersected with itself should be one and uh, so on. This is what I mean by symplectic. So it's a basis of the homology of the Riemann surface. So it's the actual cycles on your, on your curve. And then we have our famous um, B differential that I talked about yesterday. So it should be symmetric, B differential. And it should have a pole in the diagonal. So the pole structure along the diagonal should be like this. And then it can have a holomorphic part that again in the most uh, typical setting we will be fixed, fixing with the property that omega zero two is normalized on the A cycles. So we want this to be zero. And this uh, over here, will just fix the holomorphic part for us. So there is actually a unique um, symmetric B differential with these properties. Okay, so maybe just a couple of historical notes here because this is uh, something that has been confusing in the past. So let me again write the name. So this is the fundamental normalized uh, differential of a second type on your Riemann surface. So it's a geometrical object attached to your Riemann surface. And you can find exactly this definition, for example, in Fay lectures. So in a quite uh, classical uh, reference. So it's uh, called uh, theta, well, something on theta functions. <laughs> Uh, lectures on theta functions, maybe. I don't I don't remember the title, but. Yeah? Uh, yeah, but that is another one. That is by um, Mumford, no? Or by, no, but. So there are also the data lectures, which are a bit uh, later. And uh, the definition is a bit more obscure there. So that's why I wanted to point to Faye. But uh, yeah, that one contains. Uh, also a lot of nice things and the construction and everything. And then the controversial name, but very typical in the community is the Bergman kernel. So at some point I thought that we had to avoid this name completely because it was completely wrong, but it's not so wrong. So this uh, kernel was actually studied extensively by Bergman Schiffer. in the 50s, so before these uh, things. Well, and actually Bertrand uh, will tell you that the, these objects uh, come back to Riemann and I trust him because he's very good knowing these old useful things, but I couldn't find a reference uh, written by Riemann uh, talking about this. So, uh, Kokotov. So there is this classical reference, Korotkin Kokotov, in which they call it Bergman kernel. And uh, yeah, it was studied by Bergman and Schiffer. The problem is that there is another one, another Bergman kernel, which is maybe more famous and uh, was introduced just by Bergman. Then Bergman and Schiffer introduced also this one and they studied it, them uh, parallel. So that's why uh, I guess the name appeared and there were some confusions because some people were writing with two ends, it should be with one end. So, okay, be careful with this name, but it's typical in the community. Hmm? Uh, 
Yes, well, we can uh, discuss about that because I, yeah. So the, the point also is that uh, this kernel is related to a very classical object, which is the green function. And yeah, it's uh, the differential uh, on each variable of the green function. And the one that I found that is more typically called Bergman's kernel is a slightly different difference, but okay. Um, Okay, so this uh, guy over here, I gave you the properties that define it, but you can actually construct it uh, with uh, theta functions or with prime functions, if you know what they are, uh, which are the, just like building blocks of meromorphic functions. That's why they are called prime functions. Um, so it can be constructed and then you can prove that it has these properties and some other nice properties. But maybe I will skip this part and only do it in the end if I have time. It's a, it's a nice construction. And then checking that it has the properties, it's, it's also quite nice. But let me give you the, the formula of topological recursion as fast as I can to not make you too bored because I think you've seen this, but then I will uh, take this opportunity to introduce the graphical representation. So, okay. The formula that we have for n bigger or equal than zero and for stable topologies is what you already saw in that case. So this formula with the residues. So with some overall ramification points, let me denote them like this. So we can even include this, these poles that I was talking about in the formula in case they gave a contribution. Then here we use our local involution around every ramification point. And uh, here we have the disconnected topologies without the contribution of the disk. Um, we have our two subsets. Uh, that together gives us all the, the rest of the variables, except uh, Z1. Okay, sorry if I'm uh, writing a bit small, but hopefully you can guess the parts that maybe are less visible. So again, here we have the involution. Okay, so it's the formula with the differentials that you already saw. And then uh, the proper place where they belong to. Yes? The, is it Z2 up to Zn? Ah, yes, 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 sorry. Thank you, thank you. Very good. <laughs> Okay, if I write it, at least I should write it correctly. So exactly, thank you very much. This should be I and J. And then I should be closing the parentheses. Okay. Yes, so they are differentials on the symmetric product of the curve with poles at ramification points. This is what this notation means. It does, uh, Write it in case you wonder exactly where, where these objects live. But I will uh, maybe also write it with words. So, okay, the diagrammatic formula that actually gives us a tool to work with graphs if we want to make computations with graphs. It's we represent omega gn with a surface of genus g and n boundaries. So first observation, uh, the Z1 in this formula seems to play a very special role. But actually, since I'm telling you that they are symmetric, it doesn't, but it's something non-trivial at all that you need to prove. So here we take um, the surface in which we remove a pair of pens and it gives us one less genus and one more boundary, so genus minus one. And then here we have a Z2, Zn. And here we have the same, but uh, the disconnected case. We... 
So in here we have uh, genus eight. And here we have the rest of the genus. And here we have I and here we have J. So the Z to Zn should indeed be uh, distributed among the two components. And uh, yeah, these guys give us a diagrammatic way of working with uh, topological recursion because we can also think of this as a, as a graph. So as a surface with marked points, it's the same. And then uh, you keep going with the, with the degeneration, you use uh, trivalent vertex for this, you keep going and you find that the formula of topological recursion can be written as a sum over graphs with certain contributions for the graphs. And this is very useful for many proofs. So let me write already the first property that I already kind of said, but it's important. So omega gn are symmetric in their n variables. Um, yeah, and then for the stable topologies, they only have poles at ramification points of order 6G minus 4 plus 2N. Yeah, and maybe last bit, they also have vanishing residues. I don't know how much more I will be able to say, but maybe this property is important to prove some of the other properties. So I wanted to say it. So, okay. Are there some questions of the general formalism? Um, I think in uh, non-degenerate cases, it should be exactly this number. Is it true? Yes. Yes, yes. Hmm. So, okay. Um, topological recursion, a bit as we saw, because uh, maps and one Hermitian matrix model is really at the origin of topological recursion, um, was born to solve loop equations of matrix models. Um, and then uh, it was um, upgraded to a formalism that was beyond matrix models. You don't need a matrix model at all to define all this. Um, you just define your spectral curve, you apply it, you have topological recursion, but it was born to solve loop equations. And then many, many different matrix models started to appear in the formalism. So uh, it was normal to think maybe this is something quite universal. Um, and uh, yeah, nowadays uh, it's a theory with a lot of structure. And one of the reasons is that these loop equations were upgraded to some abstract formalism as well. So it's what I will present briefly now. It's the abstract loop equations. Okay, this was introduced uh, later in a paper in 2015 by uh, Borot, and uh, later it was studied in a more general setting by Bogo Shadrin. It's this uh, blobbed topological recursion that you heard in some of the lectures. So, okay, we have a collection of differentials with possible poles alpha one, alpha r. And we can actually characterize the fact that they satisfy topological recursion with some abstract loop equations. So they look, uh, the two second ones look a lot like the loop equations that I told you. Well, a lot, I don't know if uh, a lot, but they are very related, of course. And the first one is a bit more structural. So we need, actually to have this thing that is called uh, in some papers by uh, Shadrin School um, projection formula. And uh, the definition is actually just that the forms 
are actually given by their uh, divergent part. So what do you mean by this? Uh, let me write the formula and I explain what it means. We have a sum over all the possible poles. And we take a residue of this together with this uh, kind of local Cauchy kernel. So it's uh, the, the integral of the omega zero two. So, okay, this guy, since it has a double pole, you take this residue, it will always give you the diversion part of this guy evaluated at Z zero, that is uh, the other variable of omega zero two. Um, okay, the point is that there could also be holomorphic parts or even uh, parts with other poles. So we could be missing them. So we need that we recover exactly everything like this to have the classical topological recursion. And then we have the linear loop equation that it's the, it's, uh, the generalization of this Q-symmetry property that I was telling you about. So it says you have a certain combination. So I told you that these guys have poles at ramification points, but you find centered certain combinations that don't. So it should be holomorphic at every ramification point for all i, and g, and n bigger or equal than zero. And well, we can also write this as part of the properties. Actually, it has at least a zero at uh, alpha i. Yeah, I mean at uh, z equal alpha i. So this is the linear loop equation in the abstract formalism and then the quadratic one. But okay, hopefully it doesn't look too mysterious. Looks like what you are expecting. So here it's important we put all the topologies. So we need to combine all the omega GNs to give us something that is again holomorphic at the ramification points. And in this case, it has at least a double zero at uh, the ramification points. Okay. So these are the abstract loop equations that allow us to characterize topological recursion. And then a first comment on generalizations. So you can remove the property A, as I commented. And then this gives us, well, actually the formalism of blocked topological recursion proved well, in this formalism, it was proved that the solutions are always given by uh, omega zero one and omega zero two, plus this collection of blobs, as we saw in some of the short talks. Um, so we can write kind of the moduli space of uh, solutions for fixed omega zero one and zero two, and they are these holomorphic pieces that we are missing with respect to the ramification points. So they are also symmetric and they are usually called something like phi gn.
And then uh, we can also allow higher ramification points. This was introduced by uh, um, Bouchard and Art. And in that case, we would find higher loop equations as well. But there are many more nowadays, like you can consider unramified curves, but to be able to define this, we would need to need, know uh, quite uh, some more things. You can also define it for singular spectral curves in some uh, suitable cases that were studied uh, recently by Rainier, Kramer, uh, Schuller, Borro. Um, yeah, so then uh, this is a, a very important part of the formalism. Another one that uh, goes, uh, yes, you can erase that part. Thank you. Um, is that uh, we can actually parameterize the space of spectral curves with some parameters. And then we can know from the general formalism how the omega TNs behave, how they tend with these uh, parameters. So I don't know if to present this part because maybe I want to say properties and, well, maybe I can uh, do it a bit quickly. So are there some questions about this? Uh, yes? Ah, good point. Ah, yes. Uh, he was asking if uh, from these after loop equations, you get a global spectral curve or just a local one. And uh, yeah, you just get a, a local one. So yeah, this is maybe important. Just a very quick remark on this. Local spectral curve. What I mean by this is that we just take a collection of disks around each ramification point. And as you can see in the topological recursion formula, that's the only thing that plays a role for the formula. The point of having the global spectral curve is that um, many, you, you have many techniques because of this uh, Bergman kernel being defined globally, for example, and being an object of your uh, whole Riemann surface. So there are things that, that you lose if you don't have this, but in this formalism, you actually work with local spectral curves and it's enough. Okay, so maybe I will uh, try to introduce this uh, part a bit quickly for you to see, and we will go to the main properties and a bit of hand waving for the context. So we start presenting a basis in which we can decompose every um, meromorphic form. So I write uh, omega zero one like this, but this is okay for any meromorphic form. So we actually find a basis with some parameters of the holomorphic forms, then we have a basis of the forms that have poles of order greater than two. This is this part. And finally, we have the part that contains the residue, so it contains the simple poles. And this is this part. So, okay, I'm saying this a bit fast, but the nice point is that here you can recover everything uh, from the Bergman kernel. So you can see why this is such a nice object. So we have second kind, uh, first kind, second kind, third kind. And this works for, wait. Actually for what is called the generalized cycles on the spectral curve and for forms as well. So it can refer to the cycles or to the forms. And I will tell you briefly what I mean by this. Okay, this is very bad because this is uh, the space for the second ones is very small. And those are the most cumbersome ones.
Okay, so I got a bit more space. So here we can uh, put the holomorphic ones, and they are actually given by the integrals over A cycles, so the actual cycles of the curve of omega zero one of Z. Then the T's are just given by integrals over small uh, contours around the point P. So they are actually just residues, but I write them like this to emphasize that this can be seen as a cycle. So you can see them kind of in, in a generalized way. So yeah, I didn't say this, but this uh, thing that looks like a zero is actually an O. So this is a, any point in the in the curve, but it will not, our decomposition will not depend on this O. I mean, the T's will in the end not, uh, the, the thing will not depend on the O because we have that this is equal to zero because this is just the, the residues. Okay. So then the third kind of cycle are just this type of chains from one point to the other. So, okay, here is like the first kind of parameter, second kind, third, sec, uh, third kind. And what I mean by the generalized cycles, so maybe I'm not being very clear, it's these uh, guys over here, then this guy together with the thing that you need to put in the integral, and then these guys over here. This is the generalized cycles. So they include the actual cycles of the curve and then this uh, second type and third type. And then these uh, parameters, we can call them in general T and I will present you these uh, deformation formulas. But first, let me tell you that you can also get the forms. You just need to take the integrals over the B cycles. Oh, and I'm writing uh, this completely wrong. So I'm writing here omega zero one, and this is completely wrong. Sorry, sorry. This is omega zero two. I was saying that you can recover everything from the Bergman kernel. So, okay, for the parameters, you need integrals over the generalized cycles of A type of the Bergman kernel. And then the variable that survives is just the other variable of the Bergman kernel. Ah, yes, yes, of course, of course. Sorry, sorry, what am I saying? It's uh, zero, zero 02 is in here and zero 01 is in here. So this was correct. Ah, sorry. Yeah, of course, uh, here you don't have any variable surviving. Yeah, thank you, Bertrand. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. It's a uh, zero one is in here. Yes. So for this um, formalism studied in a more like focused way, so you can uh, check the last uh, paper of uh, Bertrand uh, on this that is from uh, 2017. And he has this uh, beautiful formalism on these uh, generalized cycles. So, okay, for this, uh, you need to introduce these um, coordinates. So here you actually put the omega zero twos and you actually have forms on one variable. So now everything makes sense. And uh, yeah, maybe, I, for completeness, I will briefly introduce what I mean by this uh, xi's. So they are just the coordinates uh, for x around every type of point. So either we have a pole and then it will just be the coordinate. Um, yeah, sorry that this is a bit fast, but... Um, Hopefully you are getting the idea. 
So then we have uh, points that are non uh, poles and non ramification points. And then you can write the coordinate like this. And then you have ramification points that are not poles. And then you can write it like this. Okay, so yeah, this uh, order of X will be the order of X at the pole, so it will be uh, negative. So otherwise, if you put the multiplicity, you have to put a minus sign. Okay, so it's just uh, what uh, the general theory tells us, that it's this very useful and very important result, is that we can actually control these deformations for the whole family of omega GMs. So if we find the, so I said that these are the, the general um, parameters, I call them T, all of them, and the corresponding generalized cycle, I call it D over DT. So the first thing that one needs to do to apply this theorem is to find the cycle that you need to put in here that corresponds to your deformation. So this property actually should define for you the, prop, the, the cycle. So it defines the deformation. Sorry, it, re, it defines the cycle. Then you also need to prove, but this is uh, given uh, directly from the normalization property of omega zero two that we took. In general, you have to check it, so I will write it. So this is proved from Rauch formula. And then what the theorem tells you is that this is propagated to all the topologies. So, so I unfortunately didn't introduce n bigger or equal than zero yet, a bigger or equal than uh, one yet, but it's also true in that case. I will uh, do it quickly now. So it tells us that uh, these behave in the same way, these variations with respect to this T parameter. Okay. So maybe let me finish with the properties and context uh, quickly, and then we will go to questions for all this last part. Okay, so I will give you just the most important ones. Um, for you to remember the, all the important ideas because we don't have much time left. I don't know if we will see uh, some of these uh, in the formalism that Bertrand is presenting maybe. So I actually wanted to prove this uh, Dilaton equation. So this will tell us how to reduce uh, the N so we take a phi that is just a primitive of our omega zero one. Okay, this will be defined up to a constant. But this will not depend on it because we actually have this property that the residues around the ramification points of the omega GNs are vanishing. Okay. This is the property that I told you before. So it will be well defined because of this. Okay, so you can see that this formula allows us to go from our omega g n plus one 
to omega g n, just using this um, primitive of uh, omega zero one. And then this formula extends to n equal to zero. And in actually, it's actually the definition of the FGs, of the free energies, which are the omega g zeros for g bigger or equal than two. So as usual, F0 and F1 are much more complicated to define, so they will not be in this, uh, in these lectures at all. Um, sorry, but then let me tell you about some properties that have to do with, uh, with this FG. So first, homogeneity. If we actually change Y to lambda Y, the only thing from, topological, from the topological recursion formalism that changes is the kernel. And it will just tense, you can uh, check easily the formula. It will just be divided by lambda. So the only thing that uh, we get is just a lambda to two, two minus two G minus N. And why is this? Well, in the topological recursion formula, we have the kernel. It appears now with, uh, with a lambda on the denominator and we have uh, this number of steps to arrive to that topology. So of course, uh, positive. So that's why we get exactly this um, homogeneity. And now very briefly, I tell you about symplectic invariance that you also heard in some of the short talks. And it's a very important and still mysterious property. And uh, you will see um, combinatorial interpretation of this property in Severin's talk on Friday. That will also make a, a little bit the connection to free probability. So, okay, if we send uh, our Y, so now I'm talking about uh, transformations of our spectral curve and we want to see how the output transforms. So we send y to y plus r of x, where this is just a rational function of, on x. And then you can check that uh, this leaves everything invariant. So actually, omega gn depends on uh, what? On the Bergman kernel that only depends on the Riemann surface. Then it depends on K that also depends on the on uh, X and Y through the denominator. And then it also depends on the number and position of the ramification points. Okay, so you can check that this just uh, may change the, the kernel, but it doesn't. Then, uh, we have the same for this, where lambda is just complex number. And then the last one maybe here is really small to write it, but okay, I will uh, try to do it big with uh, this uh, weird notation for fractions, but <laughs> okay, I'll just write it like this to make it a bit bigger. So y transforms like this and uh, sorry, x transforms like this and y transforms like this. So, okay, these three guys, the only thing that may change is the kernel and they actually leave it invariant. Um, so they preserve, okay. So I didn't say uh, one of the most important things that maybe you guessed from the title, symplectic invariance is called like that because all these properties preserve the symplectic form. So the X wet the Y. So these three ones are the ones that are understood. They preserve K, so they preserve everything. So yeah, okay. They leave the omega GNs unchanged. And then the last one is the mysterious one. 
So I can only state it conjecturally. And uh, of course, here's a much more difficult one, but also more interesting. So this one also preserves the symplectic form. That's why it's uh, also in the symplectic invariant part. And it just extends, extends this X and Y for you. So this changes everything actually. Changes the kernel, the position and number of the ramification points. It changes for sure the omega GNs. And then the conjecture is that the FGs should be somehow invariant. And I will just say very vaguely up to correction. Uh, constants. Okay, and then uh, I really wanted to present this because you will see a combinatorial interpretation of this in uh, Sivan stock. And uh, so finally, I wanted to give uh, very briefly um, some examples and some hand waving of the context. So I will do it. Uh, I will do it um, fast. So maybe what I can say is that it has many more nice properties, some modularity properties, some integrability. So I was not very worried about not presenting uh, more examples with details because you saw many of them in the short talks. But I just want you to at least remember the most emblematic. Uh, curves. So very briefly, I tell you, this is the airy curve. And this was giving us the psi class intersection numbers. We can, of course, discuss uh, later about particular uh, cases or things that maybe you don't know what they are. So they are intersection numbers on the moduli space of curves. You maybe even saw the definitions in some of the talks. Then we have the Lambert curve. That gives you simple Hurwitz numbers. And this counts uh, ramifications of the sphere with a given ramification profile uh, over infinity. Then a very important example is the mirror curve of a Tori Calavia threefold. This just gives you the gram of with an invariance. of X and then a conjectural one, but also very important in uh, knot theory is the, if you take the A polynomial of a knot, you get somehow something uh, related to the color Jones polynomial. And this is only checked up to uh, non-trivial uh, number of terms by uh, Borot and R. So, okay, finally, let me take two minutes to give you the, um, the continuation of uh, Danilo's uh, picture, in which I present uh, the connection to other topics. So then I give you the promised uh, context So here we have an uh, intersection theory on MGN. This we also saw in Sadin's talk that is always related to topological recursion. So it's always related to the spectral curve. And this can be seen um, as well. This is a result by an out and DOS, DOS formula that you saw in many talks. It can be seen as some kind of mirror symmetry statement. 
Then here we have uh, combinatorial problems. So some of the most uh, important groups are Hurwitz theory and maps. And connecting these two problems directly, we have ELSB formulas. Here we have a matrix models. Here we have kind of weak types of arguments. And as you saw, obviously, this is all related directly to topological recursion, which also helps uh, building the other connections. Then this is very re related to integrability. which is also directly to, related to topological recursion by the quantization procedure that I will not describe at all. And uh, as Danilo was hinting, what is uh, being developed is this uh, resurgence part that takes care of the non-perturbative effects. So it takes care of this type of terms. And it's very related to, the, to this formalism of the geometry of the curve uh, of the generalized cycles that I was talking about. So the relation to integrability is being established. So this uh, hopefully will give some kind of analysis in the realm of topological recursion in a systematic way. And then the relation to other parts is also being established. So yeah, this is uh, everything. Thank you, sorry for going over time. there any questions? Just a moment. Thank you. Hi. Um, Hi. I wanted to ask about uh, the Dilaton equation. Uh, Dilaton so, equation. Yeah, the Dilaton equation. Mm -hmm. So it seems like, it, you know, some sort of some incarnation of the, the Dilaton equation holds in everything that satisfies TR. Uh, so this is somehow defeating my intuition in Hurwitz theory, where I, I cannot think of a Dilaton equation for simple Hurwitz numbers. Is there um, so is is there a geometric way to interpret the Dilaton equation in the TR of simple Hurwitz numbers that tells me something about simple Hurwitz numbers that hmm. is geometrically? Uh, yeah, I don't know. So my expert on Hurwitz theory wants to answer maybe. Um... I don't know of a geometrical interpretation in Hurwitz numbers of the Dilaton equation of topological recursion, but uh, but okay. But Hurwitz numbers are very often related to intersection three theory through ELSB formula, and there for sure you have a very natural Dilaton equation in the moduli space of curves. But I don't know if uh, in that can be related to the Hurwitz problem because of course it's a it's it's a combination of these classes and. Uh, and then an intersection number. I don't know. Do you have a better answer? Right here, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I think in uh, maybe in, in a paper of yours, you gave a, a concrete proof in some uh, case. Ah. OK, I will also check that. <laughs> Thank you for Thank the you. question. <laughs> Hi. Um, in your section about simple invariance, case C, Y goes to a function of X only. Is this, is this something missing? No. Or... Sorry, sorry. Um, so case C of symplectic invariance, uh, the upper black. There, there's no ah, Y. The, y ah, the case C. Yes, yes. Okay. Is, there's no Y uh, dependence? Why it holds? Ah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, okay. <laughs> that's a, yes, it's a taco. <laughs> taco. Okay. So a typo in the blackboard. This is a name uh, that I first heard from uh, Don Chagui. I don't know if it was invented by him. <laughs> uh, so, of course, there should be Y here. Thank you. Okay. No. Yes. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> so, like that, if you compute uh, the expression from the from the kernel, you will see that it's uh, the same. 
Yeah, sorry, that was uh, very confusing. <laughs> Could you place free probability in your in the picture? Ah, uh, yes, I actually wanted to do it, but of course I I had many more vertices, I have to tell you. So free probability was going to be here, somewhere here, because it's a bit uh, related to combinatorics and to matrix models. So maybe let's let's do, there's already a, a part that is uh, figured out. Yes. <laughs> we don't know. We don't know if uh, this, uh, this would be interesting, for example, free probability with integrability. Yeah. With research, then definitely, because then you can study analytic things, maybe. Thank you. Okay, are there any questions from the online? Maybe a, a simple question. Uh, yes. You mentioned now integrability. Integrability in which sense? In which sense? Okay, so one uh, easy sense is that uh, here you have your spectral curve that is given by a polynomial, and then you can quantize it so it's a polynomial of X and Y. You can quantize it and transform it into an operator, a differential operator that depends on H bar that uh, takes care of some kind of non-commutativity. By the way, if someone thinks that this could be related to some uh, important non-commutative geometry, it would be nice. So this is the commutator of uh, Y and X, the operator of Y and X. And Y is uh, just uh, D over DX squared uh, h bar squared. Uh, so this uh, takes care of the non-commutativity and this will annihilate the so-called wave function that you build from the topological recursion of this uh, classical curve. So for every uh, problem in topological recursion, at least uh, for algebraic curves, now we know that there exists a differential operator, actually a system that annihilates this uh, wave function. So it con constructs for you a differential a system and it makes the connection to many things to isomonodromic systems and um, to WKB analysis to many, many things. Then there are more senses. There is also a Hirota equation uh, that is conjectural in general, but uh, proved in Gino Zero, I guess. Um, there are Sato relations. There are many, many things. And then there is this uh, paper by Belkan in, in which he, he uh, defines uh, with using these generalized cycles. Uh, a tau function for any um, topological recursion problem. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. There's a tau function for any system of topological recursion. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Maybe I can make just a small question. So, uh, so this conjecture is uh, already proved for some examples. Um, How open is this is this conjecture? <laughs> that's a good that's a good question. Difficult question. Um, so in in some cases, uh, the definition that I gave you just gives uh, things that are so it gives FGs that are invariant. Uh, these cases are not really, at least uh, to my understanding, are not really well characterized. I'm not able to tell you yet. If you you impose these conditions, this will be satisfied. Um, but we know it was like that in some cases also because at the beginning they conjectured it like that because they were observing it uh, for the simplest cases. Then it turned out that uh, they had forgotten some uh, correction uh, terms coming from some uh, int integration constants. And uh, so there is another a little paper in which they add these constants. And then that expression that is, uh, it looks a bit complicated, uh, is um, is correct in many, many cases. And uh, then I don't know in general because uh, there were some uh, little problems in the proof for very complicated spectral curves. So yeah, in general, we are clearly lacking understanding of this property. And especially apart from all the technical details that they also need to be figured out, but uh, we are lacking understanding of why this is happening. Also because nowadays there are generalizations of topological recursion, like 
the ones that I commented, uh, if you um, remove some conditions on your spectral curve, but also some other that give completely different context, like there's this algebraic context of Konsevich Soibelman and this more geometrical context of um, the geometric recursion. And we don't know how this fits in, the, in those formalisms at all, for example. At least I don't know. And it's an interesting question. Okay, thank you. I think uh, uh, we can now thank uh, Elba for this very nice series of talks.